It's Christmas. Happy Christmas to you all. I trust that today will be a, a very special day for you, particularly if you're spending time with your family and loved ones. I want to read to you now about the story of the shepherds as told by Luke, found in Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. It's a great story, isn't it? Showing in cinemas across Australia from tomorrow, Boxing Day, is the incredible true story, One Life. 30 seconds to on air. Okay, and you are just here. Good night, said Father Bear. Now, an extraordinary story about a young man who many years ago visited Prague. What he found there were thousands of refugees at the mercy of Hitler's imminent invasion. Do you ever think about the children and what happened to them? Oh, some stories. That's really not about me. We are working to evacuate these children by train to safety in Britain. Why are you doing this, Mr. Winton? Because I may be able to do something about it. I must. Go! Now! Nikki. You must know we cannot save them all. You have to forgive yourself that. We started, sir. I have to finish it. We cannot let these people down. It is incredible what you achieved. We're doing as much as we can. You have a lot of faith in ordinary people. Because I'm an ordinary person. Save one life, save the world. Uh, forgive me, but how many children are we speaking about? Can I ask, is there anyone in the audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? Nicholas Winton and his family were converted to Christianity. He became a wealthy stockbroker and in 1938 he was invited to go on a skiing holiday in Switzerland when his friend cancelled the trip and instead invited him to Prague. It was during the dark days that Hitler's Nazi Germany were soon to start World War II. Winton went to Prague and he visited camps for mostly Jewish refugees that had already escaped the terror of the Nazis. British activists were already in Czechoslovakia trying to help them, but Winton's brainwave was to rescue the children by finding families in the UK to give them a home until such time it was safe for them to return to their parents. He got permission from the British government who gave approval to any children under the age of 17 to come out, but they must have a family who they would then live with during that time. Winton's mother helped 
him find homes for 669 children who left Prague by train, arriving in England to new homes. Within a few months, the Nazis had invaded Czechoslovakia. Tragically, all but a handful of parents of those children survived the war. Winton and other activists work in saving these children when unnoticed for 50 years until in 1998, his wife found a detailed scrapbook in their attic consisting list of children and their names and, and the addresses of the families that took them in. She gave them to the media and what happened next was amazing. And that's where the movie comes in. 2,000 years ago, God sent his son Jesus on a similar rescue mission. His children, the Jews in Palestine at the time, were oppressed by the Roman Empire. Not only did God hear the cries of his people, but it was time to deal with the penalty of man's sinfulness. And so we are told in John 3:16 that out of God's love for the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. On that first Christmas morning, Jesus was born. God came down into our world. During December on Sunday mornings, we at Reading have been looking at the reasons why Jesus came that first Christmas, but also comparing that to the time that God came down for the Hebrews in Egypt. In the first week, we looked at the first reason, that is to rescue in the book of Exodus, God came down to rescue. His people were in trouble as they were slaves in Egypt. And, and he says to Moses at that burning bush, I have seen their misery. I have heard their prayers. So I'm going to rescue them. And he does. Through Moses, he rescues the Hebrews. And that is the big reason for Jesus' first coming, to rescue us. He rescued all kinds of people from all kinds of difficulties. And the Gospels tells us many of these encounters, such as the man who was born blind, to the lady who was subjected to bleeding for many years, to the young boy who had violent fits, and Thomas who had issues with doubts, and many others. And of course, when he died on the cross, he rescued us all from the pits of hell. Do you need God's rescue? We all need it in the biggest sense. God's heart is to rescue sinners. If you got yourself stuck, you can cry out to him today. Having rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt, God didn't just say, there you go, I'll leave you to it. He wants to be involved with the people and they involved with him. And so God proposes something very significant. And Paul looked at this, our pastor Paul looked at this just a couple of Sundays ago. God is proposing that he and they be bound together to one another. The Bible word for this is covenant a formal, serious, binding, lasting agreement. The people said yes to this covenant. And we read in Exodus 19 verse 20 that like he did when he rescued the Hebrews, God came down again as part of a ceremony to celebrate this covenant with all its vows and promises. It was really something quite big, a defining moment in Israel's history. But all this was like a wedding rehearsal. That covenant was just a shadow of something bigger to come. The coming of the Messiah is the coming of the great bridegroom. We saw last week that the angel told Joseph to call Jesus because it means the Lord saves. But two verses later, Matthew quotes the prophet. A virgin will give birth to a son and they are to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not just a saviour, a bridegroom who comes so we can be 
totally reconciled and united with him. This idea of Jesus as the bridegroom and his people as the bride runs throughout the pages of the New Testament from the parables right through to Revelation, the ultimate wedding. To be a Christian is to be more than just be saved. Peter tells us that we are a royal, a, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. So, in the story of the Exodus, we see three times where God says that he's going to come down. The first time was to rescue. Then last week, we saw that the we saw the second time in which it was a covenant, like an amazing wedding, binding people and God together. And then if these two things weren't momentous enough, God now wants to dwell with us. We heard about this from Robbie yesterday. The wedding is finished and straight away God says, let's build a house so I can move in. The plans for the house called a tabernacle and its building takes up the next 16 chapters in the book of Exodus. The whole purpose for God to dwell in it, in this house, is so that he can be with his people. And it's the same when Jesus came that first Christmas. He came to dwell with us. In the words of John, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I actually like Eugene Peterson's translation, the message on this verse. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Then after Jesus ascended back up into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit saying, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As with the story of the Exodus, which brought Christ here that first Christmas, was to rescue us from the pits of hell, to bring us into God's family and to dwell with us by his Holy Spirit. No wonder the angels said to those shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It is good news that ought to inspire great joy. As the angel said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a saviour who is Christ the Lord. One place where they are not celebrating Christmas this year is in Bethlehem itself. There has been no Christmas celebrations in that city that is synonymous with the birth of Jesus which is in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. There's no Christmas tree or sparkling lights in Manger Square or along the cobbled stone streets that foreign tourists come and pack at this time of year. There was no Christmas parade with musicians weaving through the old city's labyrinth walkways. No Santas on the street corners giving joy to the children instead. The main square is, a sim is simply a parking lot without a hint of holiday decorations to be seen anywhere. The Church of the Nativity, famous for its cave marking the supposed exact location where Jesus was born, would be packed with long queues snaking towards this sacred spot. But this year, it's nearly empty. Last month, the Palestinian leaders of Christian denominations of the era came together and citing the devastating war in Gaza, made a unanimous decision to cancel public celebrations. A short walk from the Church of the Nativity is the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church. There, Reverend Isaac and his congregation chose this year to remember the deaths of the many children in Gaza. Using broken cement and paving stones, they placed the baby Jesus in the centre of the pile of debris from a collapsed home. 
inspired by television images of children being pulled up from the rubble. This is what Reverend Isaac said. I've always say we need to de-romanticize Christmas. In reality, it's a story of a baby who was born in the most difficult circumstances and the Roman Empire under occupation, who survived the massacre of children himself when he was born. So the connection was natural to us. I must admit, I agree with what Reverend Isaac said and did. When Jesus came that first Christmas, he came to a people who were oppressed. And because he came down to rescue, to belong and to dwell, he still comes to dwell with the oppressed. He is with the Israeli families who lost loved ones on that terrible day of October 7 when Hamas attacked so many innocent people. God is with the Israeli hostages and their families. God is with the many misplaced Palestinians in Gaza. He is with the oppressed in Ukraine, Myanmar and other places that are torn apart by war. God is with the oppressed in our neighbourhoods. In describing Christ coming into this world, the Apostle John wanted his readers to understand that many, including the oppressed, live in darkness. And so he wrote about Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So many live in darkness, with some seeing the light. But as John wrote, many do not recognize the Lord nor accept what he offers. Jesus came into our world to save us out of darkness and into his wonderful light, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. When we cry out to Jesus, he will hear and will come to be with us. He gives us hope and light in our darkness. We have to believe in his name. The shepherds believed as they experienced that incredible light when the glory of the Lord shone around them, they were told that the Saviour has been born in the town of David, which is Bethlehem. So they hurried off to check out what had been told to them. When they had found Joseph and Mary and saw the baby Jesus lying in the manger, it was like, this is the one. This is the one that the prophets all spoke about and the angels just told us about. And with that conviction, we are told in verses 17 and 18 that they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. When you believe in faith that Jesus is the one, the saviour of the world, God's very son, you will be saved from your darkness and into his wonderful light the light that gives hope and peace and, and joy. This Christmas, believe that Jesus came down into your darkness to rescue you, to belong to you, to dwell with you so that you can experience the beauty of his wonderful light. You may not be experiencing such darkness, but you may know others who are. Oh, reach out to them in love. For those in other parts of the world that are being oppressed, just continue to pray for them, uphold them before our Lord. Pray for peace. 
Christmas really is good news of great joy. Our Saviour has come. Praise God for His love for all of us. Happy Christmas. Would you please pray with me? Oh, Father God, thank you for that very first Christmas that you came down from heaven to rescue us, to bind us with us and, and God and to dwell with us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming that first Christmas for us. We know that you came to a world that lived in darkness. Darkness was everywhere and it still is to this very day. I pray that as you've come as the light, I pray that you'll give many people who are in darkness hope and peace during this very difficult time. We continue to pray for different parts of the world, Lord, that are torn apart by war. We pray, Father God, that you may bring them a sense of hope, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for anybody in our neighbourhood, anybody that we know close to us, I pray that they may experience your light this Christmas. Thank you for coming to rescue us from the pits of hell. Thank you for your love and grace this Christmas. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Have a wonderful Christmas.